October 13th, 1977. Lufthansa Flight LH 181, nicknamed Landschut, had begun boarding for a late morning flight. It was taking off from the island of Mallorca, just off the coast of Valencia, Spain. On board, five crew members and 90 passengers. 86 passengers had spent the week exploring the island beaches, luxury resorts, and Roman ruins. The other four were up to something else. Around 11 a.m., the plane rolled off the tarmac and set off into the sky. For the pilot and crew, the flight was routine, but not for long. What began as a normal flight changed completely as the aircraft neared Marseille. There were two terrorists at the back of the plane, two terrorists at the front. All of a sudden, they all stood up. Welcome to Covert, a show about the shadowy world of international espionage and top secret military operations. Well, the GSG-9 is a law enforcement agency, very similar to our FBI hostage rescue team. Uh, so they're a federal law enforcement group, a force to deal with hostage situations, kidnappings, um, extortions, blackmail. I'm Jamie Rennell, and I'm going to take you inside history's greatest special forces missions to learn about the brave soldiers and operatives who risked their lives to terminate the world's most wanted, eliminate terrorist threats, and protect countless innocent lives. And we made a list of kit and what we needed. First thing, priority, was a, a 737. Uh, the next one was uh, vehicles in case we were in IA, and uh, also ladders, shotguns, pistols, a uniform clothing that would all look the same so we could identify ourselves, um, and everything else we, we really wanted, masking tape. A plane full of German citizens had been hijacked, but who were these terrorists, and what did they want? To find out, it would take a trip all over the world, and a collaboration between two countries' special forces, the German GSG-9 and the British Special Air Service. GSG-9, cracking force, but really very little um, operational experience. Um, but the SAS were developing all these um, skills from Northern Ireland, and from other little terrorist instances around the world. Um, and I guess GSG you now thought, yeah, look, let's, let's, let's have these guys on board. Let's, let's have an observer team on board to see you know, if they can help us out. And I think it worked well for them, didn't it? This is the story of how special forces came together and formed a rescue mission, even as they followed hostages across seven countries and 6,000 miles. This is Feuerzauber, Lufthansa Hijack, Part 1. For about 30 minutes, the plane continued on its normal course, passing over Marseille, France, on its way to Frankfurt. As the plane veered north, the cabin crew prepared refreshments for the passengers. Ex-U.S. Navy SEAL Stu Smith explained that air travel was different in the 1970s. Well, airline security was completely relaxed in the 70s and 80s. I mean, you used to be able to get on an airplane without checking bags. You know, no one would have metal detectors on. You could smoke on planes. I mean, there was so it was a whole different world back then. So it was a great asset for a terrorist organization to get publicity, and they would get publicity, whether, whether it was ransom money or it was getting their prisoners who were held captive in some prison freed, and that's typically what they use these airplanes for. That relaxed security soon translated into full-blown panic. The atmosphere changed suddenly as four hijackers stood up wielding guns. Chris McNabb is the author of Storming Flight 181. There were two terrorists at the back of the plane, two terrorists at the front. All of a sudden, they all stood up. They're screaming, they're shouting. The terrorists produced pistols, hand grenades, explosives. The passengers realized instantly this is a hijack situation. The four terrorists were calling themselves the Commando Martyr Halima, 
a reference to an Air France hijacking in 1963. They herded the passengers to the back of the plane. They wanted all of the hostages visible, and they were not especially gentle. Stu Smith offered a comment on hostage violence. Well, when the terrorists first take over a plane, the first thing they want to do is create fear on that plane. And the way they do that is they usually grab some innocent bystander, I think in this case a stewardess, and they either kill them or they hit them so hard that, you know, crushes their face, you know, blackens an eye, bloodies a nose. One of the men was the obvious leader of the group and made straight for the cockpit. The co-pilot, Jorgen Vietor, was ordered to stand with the passengers. Captain Jorgen Schumann was held at gunpoint. He gets into the cockpit and drags the co-pilot out the seat. He's still holding the gun. He takes the pilot's hat, puts it on his head, and settles into the co-pilot's seat. The plane is now his. He announced to all the passengers that he had taken over the aircraft and that he was in control. This was a moment of sheer terror for all the passengers. They knew that everything had changed and their lives were on the line now. The crew knew that if they didn't comply, the consequences would be laid on the passengers. They had no choice but to surrender. The leader called himself Captain Martyr Mahmoud. He ordered Captain Schumann to fly the plane to Lanarka, Cyprus, except that would add six hours to the planned flight. They didn't have nearly enough fuel, so instead they rerouted to Rome. The first destination for LH-181 was Rome Airport. At Rome, Mahmoud issued some of his first demands. It took about an hour to reach the destination, and when the plane touched down, the terrorists radioed the Italian control tower. Finally, they revealed what they wanted. The four hijackers aboard the flight all were members of the PFLP, a Palestinian terrorist organization. They all had track records of violence, but all were fanatically committed to their cause and they were wanting to see this through to the end. The PFLP is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The group gained notoriety during the 1970s, notably for a series of plane hijacks. So what were they hoping to gain from this attack? What they wanted was the release of two Palestinian terrorists, along with 11 members of the notorious Bader Meinhof group, also known as the Red Army Faction. This was a German left-wing group known for bombings and kidnappings within Germany. Many members of the Red Army Faction, or RAF, had been arrested and detained in Germany. The hijackers also demanded $15 million. If the demands weren't met, the four terrorists on board would blow up the plane, killing all of the hostages. One of his key demands was, we fuel this plane or we're going to blow it up. The Italian authorities complied. Hey listeners, you got a beard? Do you stink? Do you need some help grooming yourself? I want you to check out DukeCannon.com. My latest box had the best damn beard bomb for the beard of a world champion, not for clowns. A fine line exists between the well-groomed beard of a world champion and the unruly brush of a crazed mountain hobo. I don't want to look like a hobo, I'm just saying. Duke Cannon partners with Active Duty Military to develop new ideas and review products. They're also really committed to giving back to the men and women who serve our country. That's why a portion of their proceeds go directly to support veteran causes. And quite frankly, it doesn't get any better than that. So I want you to go pick up a big-ass brick of soap, or some best damn beard wash, or solid cologne, or maybe even some bloody knuckles if you have dry hands like I do. Just don't be surprised that when you're using this stuff, all of a sudden you feel a little bit better about yourself. So here's what I want you to do. Go to DukeCannon.com right now and get 15% off your first order with the promo code COVERT. Free shipping on orders over 35 bucks. That's 15% off your first order. Promo code COVERT. DukeCannon.com Back in Germany, the job of dealing with the crisis landed on the desk of Hans-Jürgen Vishnevsky, a minister in the German chancellery. Vishnevsky also had to clear the ground with the other countries for an inevitable armed assault. With 91 hostages' lives at stake, they would be ready to take any action necessary. 
and that action would fall to Germany's newly formed elite special forces, GSG-9. Former U.S. Navy SEAL Stu Smith explains. Well, the GSG-9 is a law enforcement agency, very similar to our FBI hostage rescue team. Uh, so they're a federal law enforcement group, and they were tasked with creating a force to deal with hostage situations, kidnappings, um, extortions, blackmail, you know, all types of different crimes. Uh, they're trained in diving, they're trained in parachuting, coming out of helicopters, fast roping, rappelling, um, trained in sniper operations, and of course, close quarters combat. GSG-9 had only been established a few years earlier in 1973. It was the direct result of a terrible attack. On September 5th, 1972, at the Munich Olympics, Palestinian terrorists took Israeli athletes hostage at the Olympic Village. The German police and military launched a rescue raid, but it went terribly wrong. All of the hostages were killed. In the aftermath, Germany worked to create an anti-terrorist group so that this wouldn't happen again. If GSG-9 did end up raiding the plane, it would be their first ever mission. The new team was led by 48-year-old Ulrich Wegener. Well, Colonel Wegener was the driving force behind GSG-9. He had some experience working with the British SAS, uh, also had experience working with Israeli Special Forces groups, and he was able to take a lot of that knowledge, bring it into the Federal Law Enforcement Agency within Germany, and create this souped-up, SWAT team that primarily focused on anti-terrorism. Colonel Wagner not only was a great tactician and well-respected by his men, but he was also able to work the politics of the SWAT team, or GSG-9, and work it in a way that enabled them to get a lot more equipment. Despite Wegener's training and personal experience, the fact remained that GSG-9 had no experience with terror attacks. And a plane? Wegener realized that conducting a raid on a hijacked plane might be a little out of his depth. So he put in a call. 1,000 miles away in Great Britain, Special Air Services Sergeant Barry Davies arrived home from training. We then finished uh, in Heathrow and we drove back uh, in the counter-terrorist vehicles, uh, parked them up, uh, got our bags and it was Friday evening. Fog was setting in quite badly and um, I just missed all the guys and I went home. He had just walked in the door when his beeper went off and he had to turn right back around to camp. The office of the British Prime Minister was looking for him. The uh, head of the counter-terrorist team there and he informed me that we had to go to London and uh, as the fog was so bad, we jumped in the helicopter and we flew in the fog all the way to London. We jumped over the gate of Battersea uh, Heliport. And as we did that, sure enough, a panda car pulled up and uh, got the two scruffy individuals. And we said, look, and, uh, outside there we met several officials. And uh, I also met Alison Morrison, who was the uh, um, major at the time. And uh, we went to number 10. Barry was taken to number 10, the government headquarters, to find a variety of security heads waiting for him. There, he was debriefed about the situation with the German flight. Heads of security, uh, MI5, MS6, and all these various people. And, uh, the Prime Minister was stuck up north in the fog, and so we just had uh, four of the ministers make a decision. And um, we happened to know that the plane had just got refueled, um, the state of the passengers, what they were doing, and uh, they asked us where we got this information, and we said, from David Bullock. David Bullock was a former SAS agent who was doing ops training in Dubai. Bullock had the most up-to-date info on the plane's whereabouts. The, the information we had on the terrorist was, was basically they were Palestinian. Apart from that, we really didn't know anything else about them. Uh, the, there was a... Um, a discussion about the leader who seemed to be really powerful, but uh, although they didn't pin him to who he actually was, uh, they felt that he was, uh, he would destroy the aircraft or he would kill 
people in order to get his own way. Barry met with the GSG-9 troops who would be conducting the raid. It was decided that Barry and another SAS officer, Sergeant Alistair Morrison, would fly out and join the German forces in the rescue attempt. Nigel Ellie, a former SAS fighter, explained why the German forces wanted SAS assistance. GSG-9, cracking force, but really very little um, operational experience. Um, but the SAS were developing all these uh, skills from Northern Ireland and from other little terrorist instances around the world. Uh, and I guess GSG-9 thought, yeah, look, listen, let's, let's have these guys on board. Let's, let's have an observer team on board to see you know, if they can help us out. The SES has various contingency plans, and one of those plans was to form a counter-terrorist team, and that had already been done some years before. We practiced on uh, buildings, we practiced on aircraft, uh, we practiced on trains, and uh, we found the best way to get into place, we developed equipment to get into a place, we found the best methods of snatching somebody from a room, uh, protecting uh, hostages once we got into the room, um, covert surveillance, Assaults, assaults were the, were the big one. You know how quickly you can get in from the starting point to actually closing with the terrorist and uh, saving the hostages. The team now assembled. The next step was to find out more information on the terrorists. But as Chris McNabb explained, the more they learned, the more concerned they became. Captain Mahmoud's real name was Zuhair Akache. This was an intelligent and very dangerous terrorist. He had grown up in the refugee camps in the Middle East, where he'd become radicalized. But he was also a clever man. He trained in aeronautical engineering in the UK, and he learned how to fly Cessna aircraft. But he was ruthless. He'd also been involved in an assassination in London in 1977, and also in two assaults on police officers in the UK. This was a committed individual. In Rome, the Landschut finished refueling and took off, now headed for Cyprus. After the initial hijack, the flight is taken on this tortuous journey around the Middle East and the Mediterranean, hopping from airport to airport. Some airports refuse entry, others allow the aircraft to land. Some airports refuse landing, but the pilot still goes ahead and puts it down. All the while, the conditions in the plane are worsening and the terrorists seem to be getting more and more tense. The plane landed in Cyprus and the local government took action. A local Palestinian activist tried to speak with Mahmoud, but negotiations went nowhere. Soon, the plane took off again, now headed towards the Middle East. They were denied landing rights in Beirut, Damascus, and Baghdad. Imagine the challenges facing Captain Schumann. He has to pilot the aircraft to destinations that hadn't been planned, destinations that are refusing him entry, and all the while with a gun at his head and the threat of the aircraft being destroyed. Incredibly, he holds his nerve. He manages to negotiate every single difficult situation he comes to. On the way to Bahrain, Captain Schumann was told that the airport was closed, that they didn't have enough fuel to go anywhere else, and so they landed anyway. Immediately, the plane was surrounded by troops. Mahmoud was annoyed. He threatened the co-pilot until the Bahrainian authorities allowed them to refuel. Then they took off once again. They were now headed to Dubai. It had been over 15 hours since the hijack began. Hey folks, I want to take a second to talk about Lightstream. You know, the average interest rate on credit cards right now is over 19% APR. Do you know what yours is? I'm not a financial expert. I don't know if you are or not, but you don't need to be to know that consolidating debt can save you thousands in interest. So pay off your high interest credit cards with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. I'd say a rate of 5.95% APR with auto pay is a whole lot lower than the national average interest rate on a credit card. And that's what Lightstream is offering right now. You can get a loan from $5,000 to $100,000 with absolutely no fees, and the application is 100% online. And you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that when you have good credit, you deserve a low rate and great service. 
When I was young and in college and pretty stupid, I ran up a bunch of credit card debt on cards that had really high interest rates. So I know from personal experience that consolidating these onto a low interest loan can really, really help cut into the debt. Special offer just for my listeners. I want you to apply today at lightstream.com slash covert and get an additional interest rate discount. That's lightstream.com slash covert for an additional discount. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash covert. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes a 0.50% auto pay discount, terms and conditions apply, and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com backslash covert for more information. October 15th, 1977, Day 3. The Landschut landed once again without permission at Dubai Airport. The terrorist asked for more supplies for the aircraft, food, water, and garbage collection. But the passengers were still tired and hot. Meanwhile, Barry Davies and the rest of the GSG-9 and SAS teams had been assembled and prepared to fly out to Dubai. We landed in Dubai. We were taken uh, into custody again um, in Dubai because the curators had already warned them. Uh, they took our passports, and uh, at that stage, I think a Reuters reporter had actually seen our passports and photographed them. That's when they knew who we were. And uh, lucky for us, while well, Alistair was actually trying to get hold of the embassy in uh, Dubai with no success, um, David Bullock actually came walking past. And uh, we shouted, top of our voices, and he came running up. And uh, within 10 minutes, we had uh, Dubai military uniforms, good rank, and walking around as if we owned the place. Minister Vishnevsky joined the team in Dubai to begin negotiations with the local United Arab Emirates government. But despite his best efforts, he couldn't convince them to let the GSG storm the plane. Dubai instead insisted on using local troops— ones who didn't have any specialist training. Only Barry, Alistair, Ulrich Wegener, and the sergeant major were allowed to land. The rest of the GSG-9 team remained grounded. Well, when they landed in Dubai, part of the political process for them to be able to be, even be in Dubai, potentially doing an operation, is that they had to also work with the Dubai Defense Force, uh, I think their army. Uh, so... When, you, when you're a special forces group or a special operations group that goes and works with an indigenous army, um, military, you typically have strengths and weaknesses, uh, as with any joint operation. Uh, the good strengths of this is that the lay of the land, um, you know, some of the customs, you know, every, any little thing that you can get from the, the indigenous force uh, will only help you. However, they might not be as well trained as as you are, so you can you can at least use them uh, in a security level, you know, perimeter security, and make things work. And everybody feels like they're a part of this mission. Davies, Wegener, and the new team met in the control tower. Behind them sat the Landschut, idling in the heat. The lives of the people on board were in their hands. But what exactly were they up against? Well, it's, it's critical that you need to know um, not so much why the terrorists have taken the aircraft or hijacked the aircraft. Uh, you need to know how many there are. You need to know what type of weapons they've got. Have they got explosives? Okay. And is there a communication? Is there a line of communication set up? Are they willing to talk? They needed to know what was going on inside the plane. But on the open tarmac, there was no way to approach the plane without being spotted. But then, Davies says, something unexpected happened. As they were asking for supplies, Captain Schumann said something odd. He asked for very specific cigarettes. Could you get us uh, uh, four cartons with cigarettes? Okay, any trade? Mixed. Different ones. Two of this and two of this, maybe. Uh, Roger, okay. They learned by the pilot, they hadn't said exactly how, it materialises it with some uh, cigarettes, which indicated there were two men and two women, and this was, was correct. That information was everything. 
Now Wegener and the team know exactly how many terrorists they're up against. And they had to make a move soon. The day was nearly 48 degrees Celsius, or 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The people on board were likely struggling with heat exhaustion, both the passengers and the terrorists. They were on the tarmac where it's 120 degrees. Um, terrorists are tired, passengers are tired, thirsty, hungry, you name it. You know, it, highly stressed on that plane. Probably would have been a great time to uh, attack that plane, but for political reasons or for whatever reasons, it, it just didn't work out. Um, however, they were vulnerable at that time. And as a negotiator or as the operation force, you could tell that they were starting to weaken, whether it was spiritually or physically or whatever, you know that when it's 120 degrees in a cockpit, passengers are having a hard time, but the terrorists are also having a hard time. The heat gave the GSG-9 another lucky break. The airport authorities tried to get the plane's air conditioning system running, but they put fuel into the wrong tank. That meant the terrorists were forced to open the plane's doors for air, leaving the interior exposed. They revealed themselves, though, to GSG-9 photographers who took pictures of them. They were all wearing Che Guevara t-shirts. This helped GSG-9 to identify them so that when they got on the aircraft, they could see exactly who were the terrorists and who were the civilians. The terrorists' distinctive Che Guevara t-shirts marked them out against other passengers. This gave the team more vital insight, but they were a long way off from being ready to storm. The assault team didn't have any of the specialist gear they needed for the attack, and neither did the army in Dubai. And we made a list of kit and what we needed. First thing, priority, was a, a 737. Uh, the next thing was uh, vehicles in case we had an IA, and uh, also ladders, shotguns, pistols, a uniform clothing that would all look the same so we could identify ourselves, um, and everything else we, we really wanted, masking tape, sack saws. Yeah, shopping list. The military in Dubai didn't have the equipment, but they did have a generous spending allowance for the mission. Davies and Wegener got everything they needed and more so they could concentrate on training. We then had two quartermasters with um, so much money you could choke a camel. and uh, All they did was just go back into town and buy whatever we needed or bring whatever we needed. Uh, they were great, actually. They did just piled equipment into us. And we got to work getting people sewing the ladders the right length. Uh, my fat task was to train uh, a team to actually take over the aircraft. And for that, I had myself, Alistair, who, uh, though he wasn't Camp Terry's trained at the time, uh, he was SES trained, so it's good enough. Um, we also had uh, the two GSG-9, uh, Ulrich Wegner and Sergeant Major. And we also had about four or five guys from the Dubai, Dubai Defence Force, which David Bullock had been training. And they were good. They were very good. So we had a team. And then uh, basically to train them, I explained exactly what we were going to do. And we would do it as simple as possible. The team set off to work. First, they sawed off their shotguns so they would be easier to use in a confined space. They sprayed the equipment black for camouflage. The trickiest part was adjusting the ladders for the height of a 737. When counter-terrorist teams first started, uh, Aircraft in particular were quite difficult. With a house, you can put a ladder against the wall and climb into the window. With an aircraft, it's different. Uh, the aircraft doors are locked. However, when an aircraft's on the ground, the aircraft doors are at manual. It means you can open them from outside. And there are also emergency uh, doors over the wing, mainly, where you can actually get, gain access inside the aircraft. Now, when we first started, because there's a difference in height uh, and body shape, which is very important, uh, of aircraft. For example, the 737 is a small aircraft, 747 is a big aircraft. Um, and therefore the ladders would be longer, the the angle of the ladder against the body, because it's very important. Uh, if the body shape underneath the door is too round, the ladder is going to slip away. And if you, you put the ladder against the door, you can't open the door. So, and all these sort of things we actually had to deal with. Uh, we built a whole host of different types of entry type devices. One I remember quite clearly was a, a platform which would hold four men on it and it was a piston just drove up into the air so you could actually, four men could actually stand outside the door. 
it was so unsafe, it was just not true. The piston just wouldn't hold the weight of four men and they were balancing, waving around and it had four people with guidelines trying to hold it in position. So you'd been better off with just a, a straightforward trolley that they normally use at an airport. Uh, eventually, uh, ladders were designed, uh, which were uh, dual purpose. Uh, you can actually use them on the wings, single ladders or double ladders on the main opening doors. And uh, these were padded, they were black, they were anti-static, they had all, nowadays they're state-of-the-art and they're developed just for anti-hijack. I wanted to take a second to talk about one of our sponsors that I'm really excited about. They're called The Great Courses Plus, and I love this streaming service. It's founded on the idea that education should be accessible to everyone. Now, I know when I went to school, I went to a giant university, and there was tons of varied research and courses that you could take and thousands of majors. And the thing that I wanted to do was take all of these different courses, and I wanted to study all of these different things, and you just don't have the time. Well, this service allows you to do all that without the student loans, which, quite frankly, is fantastic. Plus, this gives you access to the Great Courses Plus app, which means you can take it anywhere. Another really amazing thing about the Great Courses Plus is that it's being taught by real college professors, not just some random person that's on the internet that made a video and decided to post it and see if he could get some likes. These are people that are really passionate and knowledgeable about what they're teaching. And I mean to tell you that that really changes the experience that you as the student will have. So I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash covert, and you get to take advantage of a free month of unlimited access to their entire library of courses. I immediately went to military history and started a decisive battles of world history course. But I'm telling you, there's a zillion things out there. Once you start looking, you'll find 17 different courses all across the spectrum that you're going to want to take. But you have to use my special URL. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash covert. Please, go ahead, check it out. I promise you won't regret it. Although most of the tools the team had on hand were low-tech, Barry had brought along a new SAS weapon that was cutting edge, a stun grenade. So stun grenades were fairly new in the 1970s. In fact, the SAS were perfecting use of them. Uh, GSG-9 knew that, so they wanted that expertise with them on this mission. No, it, would, it, it would explode with, some, with, with a bit of smoke and a couple of bangs, just enough as for a distraction. Yeah, and of course it had the ability of not having secondary fragmentation. By that I mean it's, the bits of rubber that exploded were very soft rubber and wouldn't injure anybody, okay, as opposed to a conventional grenade, which we'd get secondary fragmentation, which would probably kill you. Absolutely ideal in the aircraft, yeah. It's like a really powerful flash in a series. Uh, best way to describe it, if you go to disco sometimes and they flash the blue lights and everybody seems to move in a sort of jerky way to, to your eyesight. Well, if you can imagine that with a high explosive in between each jerk, that's what it was like for about six or seven seconds. And that disorientated the terrorist enough so you could close with them. The aim of the grenade was to create a moment of confusion that would allow Wegener's team to board the plane. With terrorists holding weapons merely inches from the passengers' heads, any rescue mission would need to see special forces breach the plane and take out each threat before the terrorists even had time to shoot. After two days of the plane being grounded in Dubai, Wegener was getting worried. Mahmoud had begun ranting to the control tower about Palestinian politics, and now they believed he was hunting for any Israeli passengers. On the plane, Mahmoud systematically goes through the passengers looking at things like passports and identity documents, mentally separating out people like Jews or, or Israeli people from the other passengers. This could have ominous implications for certain passengers should Mahmoud decide to start executing people. The makeshift team needed to move fast, but it was vital that the group do more training. The three groups that made up Wegener's team had never fought together, and they would need to be in perfect sync to get this right. 
At the other end of the airfield, they put together a mock rescue operation. A different 737 had been commandeered to replicate the plane. It was really exciting. I mean, it was exciting times. The training was exciting. Um, we had aircraft. We had special um, ranges made, indoor ranges. It used to be called the Killing House. Still called the Killing House, I think. Um, and uh, you would go inside. We had rooms that looked like the inside of an aircraft with aircraft seats in it. Uh, people would sit inside. We had a projection at the end. It was like uh, continued with the seating and we had terrorists appeared on the screen and hostages appeared on the screen. And uh, so you had to make sure you were shooting the right person because you don't know what's going to happen once you're inside the aircraft. They would use the ladders to sneak under the aircraft's windows and get through all the entrances at once. Armed with stun grenades, they would surprise the terrorists and take control of the plane. Going through two doors on either side and heading to the aisle, one group would sweep forward, the other back. They would aim to take out those in the Che Guevara t-shirts. I choked each person on the back, and when I said go, you go there. When I said do this, they went there, and, it, and that's how it worked. When you actually start training, and you've done it uh, the drill for five or six times, then you can do it without being instructed. So we just honed on everything then. Look, you could do it quicker. You'll get through that door quicker. You'll make sure the hatch comes down quicker. If people aren't used to opening a hatch, then they fumble the first couple of times. But after that, they do it quickly. They do it slicker, and you cut the time down. And the idea was to get myself and Alistair in, and the two GSG-9 guys in, and, and us four would actually take the aircraft. After hours of training, there was one final hurdle. Davies still had to prove to the defense minister that the rescue plan might work in order to get the green light. The defense minister, who was actually running the whole show in Dubai, uh, came down and we did a demonstration for him. The demonstration was really slick. He liked it, and he gave us the green light to go that night. And we would have taken him out that night. A uh, very simple approach from the rear of the aircraft, because there's a blind spot on the 737. Um, get underneath the aircraft, put the ladders against the wing, have myself and Alistair on one side and uh, um, Ulrich Wegner and his son Major on the other side and on the go, we would open the doors, gain access. With the go-ahead, the assault team made their final preparations. Soon, the mission would be done and the hostages rescued. But there was one thing they were not quite prepared for. Barry returned to the tower where the runways were all visible. But something was different. The 737 they used to practice on was sitting on the tarmac, but the Landschut was nowhere to be seen. We saw the plane taken off, and then we were told that the, the plane had just left on its own accord. Um, we actually thought that um, for Alice and I it was over. There, there, there was, I mean, there was a lot of disappointment. Um, as I said, Alice and I thought we were going to return to UK. The Germans asked us to stay. We got there. We were discussing what we were going to do next. Uh, Wisniewski, uh, I believe, made the decision that we'd follow them. And uh, we actually flew to uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, he came down and talked to us. and said, gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry, we changed the decision again. Yeah, we're going to, it's going to be a major option. That's next time on Covert. To hear the full story of the previous PLPF plane hijacking, check out our Covert episodes in Tebe. Hostage Rescue Parts 1 and 2. Covert is an audio boom and World Media Rights co production, hosted by me, Jamie Rennell. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley, Rachel Jacobs, and Karen Bevan, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had additional production help from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabingua. David McNabb is the series creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. If you haven't already, don't forget to follow us on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review.